show. Um, okay, so um, Camtasia. Blah 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 blah. Hopefully that's working. I hope it's working. Ducking. Pop 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 pop. Okay. All right. Okie doke. So um, so uh, think aware. All right. So we're gonna start talking about chapter two. This is chemistry. Again, I hope you guys have had some chemistry. I passed out a, a periodic table very, very recently. Hopefully you guys got one. If you didn't, um, go ahead and grab one over on the side here with all the other stuff that you hopefully grabbed, um, including the, the printouts of the PowerPoints and the printouts of the outline, lecture outlines, et cetera, et cetera. Okie doke. So which of these? is a property of life. I guess we didn't really talk about the properties of life. I try to make these uh, questions relevant, but then oca occasionally I grab them and throw them up there without really thinking about them. And so um, we talked only briefly about pro uh, properties of life when we talk about how viruses aren't necessarily alive. Um, which of these are properties of life? All of them, right. So ability to reproduce, to respond to stimuli, to take in and use energy, and life is complex. Um, so um, one and orderly, right. So if you guys have rooms that you live in, you know that having a room that is tidy and organized requires more effort than um, having a room that is not. Uh, so that energy, that effort, right, so um, taking in energy is required in order to maintain sophisticated organization that all living things have. <coughs> okay, so um, chemistry. So we're going to talk about uh, relevance to biology, um, what chemistry is, what chemistry pertains to, um, classification of matter, again, we learn things about by classifying them. Um, atoms, chemical bonding, chemistry of water, uh, acids and bases, and the pH scale. Okay, so chemistry is important to biology. Uh, so uh, chemistry is the study of matter, and living things are made of matter. Therefore, um, in order to understand uh, living things more completely, we should understand the rules that govern the behavior of the matter they're made out of. So biologists are interested in complex biological molecules. Again, living things are complex. The molecules that they make, the molecules you find in life, are molecules that are far more complex than in, in, in compounds, in substances that aren't associated with life, like rocks. If you look at the chemistry of rocks and the chemistry of living things, the chemistry of living things is far more sophisticated and complex than the chemistry of things that aren't associated with life. Um, Biologists, so we get our energy from what? Food. Food. The food we, the delicious food that we eat is uh, is the ultimate source of the energy which we can spend efficiently when we get enough sleep. Um, so food is chem our chemicals. Foods are chemicals, um, and we get energy from them. Uh, and when we get that energy, we also um, get structure to our body, right? In order to, if we are what we eat, we have to take what is a cheeseburger and turn it into a person, right? In order to do that, we have to be able to do chemical reactions, right? So living things are able to do complex chemical reactions that allow them to break down food and then build up other molecules. Um, both of those are complex. And then um, we are breathing oxygen. We are uh, breathing in also nitrogen and other gases. 
Um, we exist in our environment, and our environment is made out of chemicals too. So um, in a little more detail here, um, complex biological molecules. What molecule is this one? You guys recognize it? DNA. DNA. And this is, there's lots of models of DNA that you'll see in the class. Um, this one shows DNA atom by atom, right? We can see um, little blue atoms, those are nitrogen. Little gray ones, those are carbon. Red ones are oxygen. And lime green, I guess, is phosphorus. Um, yeah, so we're made out of complex molecules. Chemical principles uh, are obeyed during the assembly of those molecules. Living things do chemical reactions and get energy from them. Photosynthesis uh, is the process, is a chemical process by which energy-rich molecules are created. So what we see here is an equation, um, pretty complex, hopefully will not seem as complex to you shortly as it might now. Um, but let's see if we can break this down. CO2, what is that? Carbon dioxide. One carbon, two oxygens. Carbon di, two oxygens, right? What about this one? Dihydrogen oxide, right, so water. Um, uh, dihydrogen monoxide, right? Have you guys ever looked up that website? DHMO, you got to watch out for DHMO. It's a, it's a chemical that's all over the place. Dihydrogen monoxide. So there it is. Um, so um, that plus this is actually a, a little fancy thing for sunlight. Um, yeah, so take carbon dioxide, take water, add some sunlight, and what do you get uh, here? What's that? Oxygen. This is atmospheric oxygen um, that we breathe. Uh, and this, some people know this as glucose, right? This is sugar, right? Sugar is food has calories, and therefore can be used for energy, right? So we can take water, which doesn't have any calories, can't be used for energy. We need it to drink, but we can't exercise because we drank water. Um, and carbon dioxide, which you know, isn't useful for anything, really, for people. Um, and, uh, and those two can be combined to create something that without which we'll starve to death and without which we'll suffocate. Okay? Um, and again, we talked about this earlier. Earth has been transformed by that. Um, so biochemical reactions. Um, living things to a biochemist are nothing more than sums of chemicals that react in coordinated ways. So <clears throat> living things are collections of vast numbers of chemical reactions. These are, uh, these chemical reactions can sort of be mapped out here. Can you guys see this? It looks kind of like um, a subway map that is far more complicated than the T, um, more complicated even than, than the New York subway or the London underground. Um, each of these little dots represents a chemical. And each of the connections between those dots means a chemical reaction where one chemical can be converted into another. right? And so these are like subway lines that intersect with each other. And we can take carbohydrates and convert them into amino acids and lipids and so on and so forth, which we can do. right? And so the sum total of all the chemical reactions we can do, that is our metabolism. Um, and even the simplest, li so um, this, this very complex diagram is actually a gross simplification of the kinds of uh, chemical reactions that living things can do. So is there, does everyone get all this down? Of, of course you don't need to know all that, right? The purpose of showing is to impress upon you the potential for different chemical reactions that living things can do. And of course, microbes can do a lot more complex chemical reactions than humans. Um, all right, chemical environment. So um, again, we exist in our environment. Our environment has a pH that can be measured, salinity, and other uh, 
chemical factors influence the, the environment we live in. And any idea what this is? So as it turns out, this is actually, um, there's, there's no way you guys are going to know this, but I just thought this was kind of a neat picture. It barely uh, merits uh, being listed under this uh, description, but this is, these are spinnerets, and this is uh, spider silk coming out from the abdomen of a spider. Um, these are little globs of silk. Um, silk is, is, has greater tensile strength pound for pound than steel. Um, so uh, biochemists and other scientists are, are working hard to copy um, such, such uh, magnificent uh, materials. Chemi again, chemical reactions performed by living things transformed Earth over the billion years of its history. Um, we have uh, these things here we call stromatolites. These guys can do photosynthesis. When they do photosynthesis, they, they dump out oxygen as a waste product, and they accumulate carbon dioxide as an ingredient in making their bodies, which are made out of carbohydrates like sugar. Um, that continued process over billions of years has turned our atmosphere, the, the air we breathe, into uh, something breathable from something poisonous and toxic, which if we breathed, if we were instantly teleported in time back to two or three billion years ago, um, we would suffocate unless we, w unless we had a spacesuit. Okay, so I hope those brief introductory slides impress upon you that knowing chemistry is relevant to microbiology and, and is worth knowing. Um, so again, how do we learn about things? We classify them. We classify matter as easily as we can classify living things. All matter is anything that takes up space, that um, can be uh, uh, measured by volume or weight or whatever. Right? So um, all matter can be separated out into two different kinds of things. One is substances that are pure, that are exactly one thing and one thing only or that are mixtures of things, right? Um, such as a, a, a soda pop, for example, right? What kinds of goodies are in soda pop? Sugar. Delicious sugar, right? What else? Air. Air, carbon dioxide, the bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Water. Water is in there. Maybe some salt, some caramel Water. color, um, artificial yeah. flavoring, caffeine. So it is a mixture, right? Each of those substances it's made out of, whether it's sugar or water or carbon dioxide, are themselves pure substances. Amongst those pure substances, some pure substances are compounds, others are elements. Compounds are substances with exact proportional amounts of ingredients, like water. Water, in order to make it, it is exactly two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen in terms of numbers of atoms, OK? Um, elements are only one kind of atom, right? So, uh, uh, so iron is uh, an element, and it is made up of nothing but iron atoms. Excuse me. All right, so the periodic table is an organized display of all the matter, all the elements in the universe. Everything that exists, every th substance, all the stuff of the universe can be found here. This is all the substances that exist, right? <clears throat> we don't see people on there because people are mixtures of lots and lots of compounds and elements that can be found within them, right? Uh, so. Although we are not on the periodic table, the stuff we're made out of, 100% of it is, OK? OK, so um, some of these hopefully you guys already know, right? Um, yeah, so Na, what's that one? Sodium. Sodium, K, potassium, good. Um, C, Carbon. sounds like you guys know pretty well, uh, at least somewhat acquainted with the periodic table as a list of uh, substances. 
Um, the periodic table is organized. That means that things that have similarities are grouped together in certain ways, right? So all these things on the left are what we call uh, halogens, or excuse me, halogens are uh, a complete opposite side. These are um, alkali. There's alkali earth metals, and then there's um, yeah. So these are a kind of metal, and I'm I'm forget forgot their name. For some reason, these are the halogens here. Um, halogen uh, comes from the prefix halo, which means salt, right? So sources of salt are these halogens, and and we can use their gases and zap their gases uh, to make a halogen light bulb, right? Um, but fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all these can be combined pretty easily with things on this side. Um, the alkali metals like sodium, potassium, and lithium, and so on. <clears throat> In between, we have the transition metals. These are the metals we think of when we think about metal. Iron, nickel, copper, silver, gold, right? Uh, metals are malleable. Um, they have similar properties, right? They can be turned into wires. They can, they're ductile. Um, they conduct electricity, right? All those properties are similar. They're grouped together, um, <clears throat> uh, and so on. Um, on the right side, we have the noble gases. These are all gaseous, neon, argon, krypton. These are all, and helium. These are gases that, that we'll learn more about very soon. OK, so all elements, if we, if we take an element and chop it into smaller and smaller pieces, when we get to something that cannot be divided and still be that element, we've reached an atom, right? So all matter is ultimately comprised of atoms. Uh, atoms are the smallest individual unit of matter that retains the property of the element to which it belongs. Atoms themselves, atom, atomos, right? A means not, and tomos means to divide. It means it's indivisible, and yet, um, we know that atoms have little pieces that they're made out of. The pieces are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Each of these has slightly different uh, physical properties. Um, they have electrical charge, and they have mass. Those are two of the important properties that these subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, have. Um, protons have an electrical charge of plus one. They have a mass of one. Right? Because these subatomic particles are about the smallest thing that any scientist or anybody else deals with, they can be ascribed nice round values. Right? If there is no real thing that you can put on a scale and weigh that is smaller than a proton, why not assign a proton the value of a weight of one? One atomic mass unit is the term, AMU is the term. Um, for the weight of a proton. The weight of a neutron is equivalent. Um, it, it weighs about the same as a proton. Its charge is slightly different. It is a neutral charge, hence the name neutron. Both of those exist in a place called the nucleus in the center of the atom. Around the outside, there's a third particle, the electron, that has an electrical charge of negative one equal and opposite to the charge of the proton, um, but they are extremely small in light. Their weight is virtually negligible. That doesn't mean they weigh exactly zero, that they are truly weightless. They weigh something. It's about 1 1,800th of the weight of one of these other guys. So if we want to weigh an atom, we can basically effectively safely ignore the weight of the electrons and only consider the weight of the sum of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And then the charge of, of any atom is the difference between the number of protons you have and the number of electrons you have. <clears throat> OK, and this one has how many protons? Seven. Seven that we can see. And how many electrons? Seven also. So this atom, its net charge? Zero. 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 Neutral, right? And 
And as it is, all, essentially all the atoms, all the atoms in the periodic table, in their natural state, in their basic state, have equal numbers of protons and electrons and therefore have a neutral charge. OK. Elements are defined by the number of their protons. So there are 92 naturally occurring elements. Each of those different elements has a different number of protons. So if you have <coughs> um, seven protons like we just saw, what atom must you be? Got to have your periodic table to answer that one. You have to be nitrogen, right? So if we look at the periodic table, um, you can go ahead and grab one. I put them on the other side there. Um, so its number is seven. That means it has seven protons. And if we, if we get a pair of tweezers that are really, really small and we grab one of those protons and pull it away, then we don't have nitrogen anymore. We now have carbon, carbon which has six protons. Right? So uh, the number of protons tells you what element you have, and it tells you how that, a lot at least, about how that element will behave. Right? Um, nitrogen behaves in a different way than oxygen. OK. Or, and also a different way from carbon. Right? Carbon uh, is often a solid in its natural state. Nitrogen is a gas. Right? So, um, so those two elements uh, change a lot when you just change the number of protons by one. OK, the number of, uh, so what else? The, num the atomic number is this number in the top left. That is the number of protons that something has. The atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons that you find in an individual atom. So um, for I, I actually feel the need to have one of these periodic tables handy. <coughs> Here we go. So let's look at um, oxygen. Oxygen has how many protons? Eight. Eight. Can we infer how many neutrons oxygen must have? Eight. It must also have eight, right? Because if oxygen's atomic mass is 16, that means that um, that's the sum of its protons and neutrons. It's, we know it has to have, by definition, eight protons. So therefore, by addition, we can, we can infer that there are eight neutrons there, right? Mm -hmm. OK. What about, um, what about carbon? It's got to have six neutrons, right? There's a little difference in the, in the value there, right? And that's, uh, that is the difference between an atomic mass and an atomic weight, right? It says 12.01, not exactly 12, right? That should seem a little strange. <clears throat> Here is the reason why. Although the number of protons in, a, in an atom cannot vary and have it be the same kind of element, the number of neutrons in atoms of a single element can vary, right? So this is hydrogen. If we look on our periodic table, we can see that hydrogen has an atomic uh, mass of about one, right? That means that it has how many protons? One. one. How many neutrons? Zero. Zero, right? Usually. However, look. Here, we have something called deuterium. How many protons does it have? One. How many neutrons does it have? One. Also one. So our protons are red in this diagram. Our neutrons are gray. So this guy's atomic weight is two, right? What element is he? He's hydrogen, right? He's still hydrogen even though uh, he's got two things in his nucleus instead of one, he's still only got one proton, so he's still hydrogen, right? He actually has a special name, deuterium, 
because he's a, a, an important member of the hydrogen family, basically. Does that make sense? He's, we call these variants of an element isotopes. There's another one here, tritium, right? Tritium is still what element? Hydrogen. hydrogen. It's still hydrogen, and yet its atomic weight is three, right? Because it has two neutrons. So um, what we see here, if we look at hydrogen in the periodic table, its atomic average atomic mass is 1.01. .01. So what does that mean? What percentage of the isotopes of hydrogen do you think are regular hydrogen, approximately? About 99%, probably a little more than 99%. Does that make sense? So if we took a little jar and put a few, you know, a few thousand hydrogen atoms in it, and we bean counted, we'd find 99 of those hydrogen atoms are normal, and then occasionally we'd find one that was a little heavier, right? Or twice as heavy, technically. And very rarely, we'd find one that was three times it has, as heavy, tritium, right? Tritium is pretty important because it's a special element because it's radioactive. As it turns out, there are physical laws, laws of physics, that govern the balance in number between protons and neutrons. And if that balance gets too uh, imbalanced, then this nucleus can be unstable, right? It's like a little ticking time bomb waiting to go off. And when it goes off, it'll break off one of its uh, parts, right? And that part will go flying out, um, and it might hit you. And if it hits you, um, it, can, it can kill one of your um, skin cells, for example, right? So we call that radiation. Right? That is a kind of atomic nuclear radiation. Right? And, that is, and when those pieces break apart, energy is given off. So a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb uses the power of nuclei in atoms breaking apart. Right? Does that make sense? That's nuclear fission, breaking them apart. Um, bringing them together also, that's another story, but that's fusion, and that also uh, generates a lot of energy. OK, so that means that radioactive isotopes are unstable. They break apart and they give off radiation. right? And that radiation, if it hits your skin, it can cause harm to your skin. Um, or if it hits a piece of photographic film, um, it can expose the film, just like light would. Right? So um, if we uh, thyroid, your thyroid gland uses iodine, Right? If we give someone some radioactive iodine, that will go into the thyroid, and it'll stay there. And as it stays there, it's giving off little pieces of radiation. Right? Not enough to harm, hopefully not enough to harm the person, right? depending on the dose you give them. But enough such that we can see, by the presence of the iodine, the, the shape of the thyroid gland inside this person's body. Does that make sense? OK. OK, so a sodium atom contains 11 electrons, 11 protons, and 12 neutrons. What is the mass number of sodium? It's 23, right? Because we ignore the weight of the electrons, we add the protons and neutrons only. Great. <coughs> All right. So, oh, and here's a question that uh, well, I haven't even talked about yet, so don't even answer it. So moving on, I don't know how that got in there. Sorry, I thought I proofread all these slides, and I often miss one. So um, let's review atomic structure. We have protons and electrons in the nucleus. The elect uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, the electrons orbiting around. This is what we call the Bohr model, right? So. Um, so this is named after a guy named Niels Bohr. He's a pretty important scientist from around the turn of the century. He's dead now. Um, he was uh, Danish, I think. Um, 
must have been a really exciting guy. Um, he created this model where the electrons uh, go around the nucleus in planetary orbitals, right? Planetary is in quotes. It's like the nucleus is the sun and the electrons are the orbiting planets going around, right? That's a, that's a good analogy um, except for the fact that we can see here that there are two um, electrons in this orbit and in orbits uh, of planets you only get one planet per orbit otherwise they'll crash into each other and that would be bad. That'd be cool unless you were on unless one of those planets one, yeah. and then it would rapidly become uncool. Um, so each orbit holds a, a determined number of electrons. The first holds a maximum of two. There are two vacancies for electrons in the first orbit. The second orbit um, is, uh, holds eight, a maximum of eight. Does this one have eight? No, it has five. What element is this? Nitrogen. Nitrogen again, right? We have seven protons, seven electrons. The first holds two, the second holds five. There is room in the second orbital for three more. Okay? And if we count off from the periodic table, we can go one, one, two, three from this column to get to nitrogen, right? Uh, and that hopefully might be useful. So one last thing before I leave this slide, which is that this is a model, right? This is not a photograph, of course. It is not a photograph of an atom, right? If you zoom in on an atom, you don't see little yellow and orange spheres with pluses and minuses on them, right? Uh, it is a mental construct that helps explain the behavior of atoms, okay? Um, so, uh, electrons in the outermost shell we call valence electrons, right? So the first shell doesn't have a fancy name. The outermost shell, whether that's the second shell in carbon, the first shell in hydrogen, or the third shell in phosphorus, that outermost shell we call the valence shell, and the electrons in it we call the valence electrons. So how many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. Its outermost shell is the first shell. That shell holds a maximum of two. In, in the case of hydrogen, only one, right? Um, and how many valence electrons for carbon? Four, right? Carbon's number is six. So two electrons in the first shell, four in the second. Room for four more, right? But four electrons in that outermost shell. And if we go one, two, three, four, we get to carbon. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> All right, so why does that matter? It, valence electrons matter because valence electrons have a great effect on the ability of an atom to form chemical bonds with other atoms. So <coughs> noble gases um, have a very stable electron structure. Um, that means that how many electrons in, in its valence shell? It's eight, and the maximum number of electrons that can be held in the second shell is eight for anybody, right? So this guy's electron outermost, its valence shell, is full, right? So that means there's no vacancy in that shell for more electrons. That causes noble gases to be stable. That means when we say they're stable, that means they're very unreactive. We don't, like we can see sodium chloride is a reaction, is a compound that includes sodium and chlorine. Water, H2O, is a compound with hydrogen and oxygen. We don't see neon sulfide or anything like that. There's no compounds that we find, except under very extraordinary circumstances, in which neon reacts with other things. That's why it's called a noble gas. It's so snooty that it doesn't sully its hands with other atoms, okay? <clears throat> so elements 
combine in chemical reactions to form compounds. The take home message about valence electrons is that atoms are stable when their el outermost electron shells are filled. And if they are not filled, atoms will seek to fill them by creating deals or partnerships with other atoms in order that both atoms have stable, full outer shells, okay? That is what causes elements to combine in chemical reactions to form compounds. <clears throat> so a molecule is two or more atoms combined in specific ways. Usually that's a, 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 co uh, a covalently co combined, a covalent compound. <clears throat> um, so compounds are usually two different elements in exact whole number ratios. Two hydrogens for every one oxygen, etc. <clears throat> okay, there are two major kinds of deals that atoms can, can, can cut between themselves in order to satisfy their electron shells. The first of these we call an ionic bond. The second we call a covalent bond. Okay? Amongst covalent bonds, we have polar and nonpolar bonds. We'll talk about those soon. <clears throat> In ionic bonds, atoms, one atom takes an electron from another, or one atom gives away an electron from another, depending on how you look at it. Atoms are not living things. They don't give or take, really. They just happen. Um, in any case, sodium, its, al its atomic number, according to your periodic tables, is what? 11, right, for sodium, right? <clears throat> that means it has how many electrons? 11, how many then in its outermost shell? One, right? First holds two, second holds eight, that's 10, leaves one extra for the third shell. Good? What about chlorine? It has, its, its number is 17. It has seven in its outermost shell. Again, uh, elements are stable when their outer shells are filled, right? So in order for chlorine to be stable, how many el more electrons does it need in its outermost shell? One. It needs one more. So, um, and sodium, rather than going and finding seven more electrons for its more outermost shell, merely hands its electron to chlorine so that chlorine has a complete outermost shell and sodium has completely gotten rid of its third shell and now its second shell is its valence shell and that second shell is complete. Does that make sense? Right? So they're both happy, right? They both have complete <coughs> outermost shells and yet they no longer have equal numbers of protons and electrons. Sodium has given away one of its electrons, right? And that's how he gets a, neg a, a net positive charge. Chlorine has one more electron. It has 18 electrons and, only, and still only 17 protons. So its overall charge is negative, negative one. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why they have net charges, we call charged atoms, we call ions. So this is now, it used to be a sodium atom, now it's a sodium ion. This was a chlorine atom, now it's a chloride ion, and this is sodium chloride, the chemical we call salt. <clears throat> right? So um, let's see, what, what else is important? What holds these together? There's an attractive force, right? Opposite electrical charges attract each other in the same way that opposite magnetic uh, polarities attract each other, right? So there is a magnetic attraction between these that uh, serves to have them form a crystal like this, right? Um, so these are little sodium atoms. And if you were a positively charged sodium atom, you would want to surround yourself with negative charges, right? 
Likewise, if you were a chloride at ion and had a negative charge, you would want as much positivity touching you as possible. Right? And so this, this arrangement makes the most sense for both atoms. Okay? <clears throat> so um, I guess that, that uh, begs another point. Right? This is sodium, which is a toxic metal. This person is holding it with gloves because if they touched it with their regular hands, the sodium would ra react with the water in their hands and that would form sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base would start to corrode their skin. Um, this here, what's that? Chlorine. Chlorine gas, right? This was used as a chemical weapon in World War I by, by uh, both German and French and English forces, right? And they would use this chlorine gas open little canisters when the wind was favorable and it would go from one trench to the next and then guys would breathe this in and the chlorine gas would react with their lungs and, and uh, start to corrode and degrade their lungs and, and they would drown in their, in their own <coughs> decomposed lung tissue, right? So both of these are extremely nasty chemicals. Two poisons, put together. two poisons put together make something that, you know, if you have too much you can, you can get some high blood pressure, but if you don't have any salt, you'll die, right? This is a, something that is necessary for life. Yeah, so what we see here is, um, is an emergent property. There's no way we could predict from looking at the chemical properties of these two ingredients that they would make something that was uh, necessary for life. Okay, so the nucleus of an atom What's in there? Protons and neutrons. Phew. OK. So we've just discussed ionic bonding, a kind of deal, a kind of arrangement between two different kinds of atoms that allows those atoms to find stability in their atomic lives, so to speak. Um, although, again, they're not alive. So here's another kind of deal. And, and in biology, this is arguably a more important deal, although both, you could just say, are essential. Um, this is covalent bonding. In covalent bonding, electrons are shared, right? So here we have uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton, one electron. How many does its outer shell want? It wants one more to have a total of two. Right? One hydrogen atom can't give away its electron to the other. Instead, what happens is, as long as both of them hang out together, as long as they stay physically connected, then this guy's, uh, this guy's, um, this guy's electron shell has its own electron plus the one it borrows from this guy for two. And the reverse is true for this guy. It's got its electron plus the one it borrows from that guy. So as long as they stay together, as long as they hang out together, their electron shells are satisfied, right? One of its own, one it borrows. What about oxygen? How many electrons does oxygen want to get in its electron shell? Two, right? And we can count that out. One, two uh, on our periodic table. So instead of sharing one, it shares two with another oxygen atom. Right? We call this a double bond. Okay? Does that make sense? So this guy has eight. That means two in the first shell, six in the second shell. It wants two more. It borrows two from this other oxygen, and the other oxygen does the same. Okay? That way they both have eight in their outermost shells and they're pretty stable. Here's another one, methane, right? This is CH4, carbon with four hydrogens. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. It wants four more. So uh, instead of sharing four electrons with another carbon atom, it finds four individual hydrogen atoms and shares one of its electrons with each, right? So now. This, each of these hydrogens has one electron plus one it borrows from car carbon. Carbon has four electrons 
plus one each from four different hydrogen atoms for eight for the carbon, right? Methane, right? Do you guys know about methane? Methane gas, this is natural gas that you get uh, in your stoves or in the Bunsen burners that we used. Um, it's also a nice propellant for other aromatic compounds that blast out of uh, human and other <laughs> mammalian um, apertures. So uh, likewise, water, right? Two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen. Each of the hydrogens shares one, so the oxygen has eight, and the two hydrogens each have two. Great. All right, so again, the reason this is important is because now we have created partnerships that cause molecules to happen, right? In order for you to have methane gas, these hydrogens and this carbon have to stay together, right? They have to stay together in neighborhood ship, and they have to stay together in arrangement, right? This hydrogen has to be just to the left, this one right above, this one just to the right, this one right below, right? In order to have water, we need to have a, a hydrogen here and a hydrogen there, right? And so molecules have a physical shape, and those shapes become important. Okay, right? Here's a pretty important molecular shape, right? The fact that these molecules have to stay together to keep their electron orbitals filled allows an extremely complex molecule to form amongst a bunch of uh, random and non-sentient atoms, okay? So um, covalent bonds hold together all these incredibly c complicated molecules that living things are able to make and require in order to live, okay? All right, um, so furthermore, covalent bonds can be traded. And as they, so a chemical reaction between carbon dioxide and water means that the carbon and water give up their bonds, right? The, the oxygen lets go of the two hydrogens and joins to a bunch of other carbons and other atoms to create a different molecule. Does that make sense? And and that molecule can itself be broken down to get energy, right? Anytime you trade covalent bonding partners, there is a difference in the amount of energy that is either created or required for that to happen, right? And so um, in this reaction, energy is required, right? L sunlight makes photosynthesis happen. In this reaction, this is what we do when we eat, we take uh, carbon glucose and combine it with oxygen, right? Uh, and we get energy along with these two waste products, carbon dioxide and water, right? So, um, and that's, this is what happens when we eat. It is also what happens when we take a piece of paper and light it on fire, right? Um, the paper is essentially made out of carbohydrates, glucose polymers. Uh, and when it burns, it combines with oxygen. Energy is given off in the form of a flame, and carbon dioxide and water are waste products. Okay, so chemical reactions solely involve the exchange of covalent bonding partners. This is what I was just jabbing her about. We have sugar here mixing with oxygen. Energy is given off. This difference between the amount of energy here, don't you love it when that happens? Yeah, I don't either. Uh, and so on. Jabberty, jabberty, jabberty. Where, where's my cool thingy here? So the next page, you guys all have the, maybe I should be printing these, right? Um, you can see uh, a big uh, blimp. Can you guys see that? That's the Hindenburg. That was um, hydrogen gas filled that thing to make it lighter than air. Uh, and then when it uh, 
there was, it crashed into the mooring tower and there was a little spark from the friction um, that combined with the oxygen in the atmosphere to make um, uh, a big uh, rock and roll album cover and explosion and kill a bunch of people. Um, that reaction is reversible. Can you guys see that? Um, I don't know why this thing is not working. Um, but uh, I don't pay that. Not with my check. That would not cover it. And I guess maybe that's our problem. Well, what do you guys think? You want to take a break? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I've got, we'll take, it's lunch, isn't it? It's noon. What a, what a happy coincidence for you guys. Um, so why don't we take a half hour lunch? I have a half hour to try to solve this problem and eat lunch. Uh, I'll see you guys here at 1230.